He's starred in God's Not Dead. Now he's playing the voice of God after Kevin Sorbo takes us inside his latest project. Then, how Christian groups are fighting back against campus correctness. They know they can't just kind of roll right over you. Plus, the man who helped build three World Series champs reveals the secrets of his trade. There's no way to do it alone. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Important hearings start today over the nomination of a new Supreme Court judge to fill the role of Antonin Scalia. But you know, what we've been witnessing uh, is a judicial overreach. <clears throat> it is a judicial coup that should never be happening. No way under heaven should a district court judge have the power under our system to overturn the sovereign acts of the duly elected president of the United States. This is absolutely outrageous, and the left has been cheering it on, but I wonder if they understand what dictatorship is like, because that's what it is. It's the dictatorship of an unelected person who should not have the power beyond the district that he's involved in. The idea that one judge in Hawaii or wherever could put out a decree that would bind the entire nation, it's outrageous. And I think it's time people speak up and say no. And I like what Andrew Jackson said. He said, uh, okay, uh, the Chief Justice has made his decree, now let him enforce it. And I, I think, you know, the time has come. We say we're not going to enforce this nonsense. But anyhow, President Trump kept his campaign promise to nominate a justice to the Supreme Court who believes in the Constitution. And today the Senate confirmation hearings begin for that nominee, which will change the balance. It will take it back to a 5-4 a, a, a uh, majority, I guess, of conservatives. But uh, we, we'll see what happens, Terry. That's right. Well, now the big question in the Senate is, will Republicans have to use the nuclear option to get Neil Gorsuch confirmed to the high court? Abigail Robertson brings us the story from Washington. What you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Preparing for a Senate showdown takes focus, intense research, and looking your best. Judge Neil Gorsuch has met with more than 70 senators, brushed House up on his own past legal opinions, own and practiced for an State anticipated State grilling State from State probing State senators. State. All this for a potential lifelong seat on the highest court in the land. Senator McConnell has promised to get this nomination done before the Easter recess. Gorsuch will likely be confirmed, although it could be an unprecedented journey to the bench. Judge Gorsuch faces three to four days of hearings in the Judiciary Committee before moving to the full Senate, where Republicans will need to find at least eight Democrats to allow the nomination to go forward for a final vote, or they may have to consider the nuclear option. That last resort would mean changing Senate rules to make any filibuster of Gorsuch impossible. Then, only 51 votes would be needed for confirmation. While rule changes can be approved with a simple majority vote, many senators don't like the idea because both sides understand the importance of the filibuster to the minority party. I think the nuclear option is the wrong thing to use. In 2013, then-Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid went nuclear to prevent filibusters on cabinet nominees and lower court judges. I think Harry Reid made a horrible mistake. A move opposed by many Democratic senators, like Joe Manchin and current leader Charles Schumer. This is the most unique body in the world, the United States Senate. It's the most deliberative body because basically the minority has a strong position. It's not, you know, in a simple majority, 51, that means the minority is discounted completely. Well, guess what? The Republicans were in a minority before, they're in a majority today. The Democrats have been in a majority, they're in a minority. That changes. So anybody that really respects this institution and understands the institution and the purpose of it, this is the cooling part. This is basically the deliberative part of governing, which makes us unique. Republicans will pursue Manchin and nine other senators like him because they face re-election in states won by President Trump. CBN News chief political correspondent David Brody believes Democrats will avoid a filibuster this time and look ahead to the next fight. 
I don't expect Democrats to filibuster this nomination. It would be surprising to me, and here's why. I I believe they'll save their powder, their ammunition, if you will, uh, for the big fight coming next, which will be over Anthony Kennedy or whoever retires next. Most likely it'll be Anthony Kennedy, and I think that's where they'll put up the big fight because that would be, in essence, uh, the big swing vote on the court. Many evangelical leaders are excited that President Trump followed through on a pledge to appoint a pro-life justice. They see this as President Trump fulfilling a campaign promise that he made, uh, and that was something that really unified a lot of evangelicals that may have had some concerns about uh, Trump the candidate. Neil Gorsuch is going to fill the shoes of Justice Antonin Scalia, and there is no better judge in this country that I can see that would do a better job of fulfilling that legacy. The American Bar Association unanimously gave Gorsuch its highest possible rating. We'll soon see if the Senate agrees. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. You know, it'd be impossible, impossible to find a judge more eminently qualified than Gorsuch. He has a distinguished career on the bench. He was unanimously approved for a a federal appeals court. Uh, He has sterling academic credentials. You know, where would you find a reason to oppose him? Well, our CBN White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon is with us now from the White House. Jennifer, do you agree with your associate that uh, they won't filibuster this one? What do you think? I do, Pat. You know, a senior White House official tells us that they are preparing for a smooth sail this week. You know, even Republicans who don't always see eye to eye with President Trump have nothing but praise for Neil Gorsuch. Um, I completely agree with uh, with David Brody and with Abigail. I think that one, um, you know, Democrats who are facing reelection in states that voted for Trump, uh, they are going to get in line, I think, on this nomination. And also, as David pointed out, you know, elevating Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court um, really doesn't change anything, uh, the balance of the court. It kind of restores it to where it was when uh, Justice Scalia was on the court. So I think uh, Democrats are going to save their filibuster fight uh, for perhaps the next nominee that President Trump makes. Let me ask you about this. I understand that the uh, FBI Director Comey is coming up to talk about wiretaps. What do you know about that? Yeah, so it's uh, the, the two, really two big stories on Capitol Hill today. Um, what I can tell you is in the past 24 hours, the uh, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes, has said that he sees no evidence that President Trump or the Trump campaign colluded with Russia to rig the election. So that's one of the things that this hearing is going to look at. Of course, the other big story um, that that members on the committee can't wait to talk to Director Comey about is President Trump claim President Trump's claim that um, he was wiretapped by President Obama. Um, it doesn't. So the, the Department of Justice handed over that uh, evidence to them last week, um, but it doesn't look like there's any necessarily smoking gun. I think what the committee is going to really look at is whether or not people were swept up kind of in, um, you know, unintentionally in surveillance activity, like we saw the former national security advisor who um, was surveilled when he talked to the Russian ambassador. So um, they're looking at perhaps if that happened and whether or not that information was handled correctly. Um, Another thing I can tell you is that the chairman, uh, Congressman Nunes, says that it's clear to him that... um, that there are people within the intelligence community who are leaking information in order to hurt this administration. So that's going to be another focus. Of course, the Trump administration is very concerned about that. Jennifer, we appreciate your coverage. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Wishon, ladies and gentlemen, our White House correspondent for CBN News. Well, President Trump is also facing a growing and deadly threat on the international scene. North Korea's nuclear weapons program, the communist country tested a new rocket engine system over the weekend, which is supposed to have the power to launch a missile all the way to the continental U.S. George Thomas has that. North Korea's official news agency called it another miracle and said this latest test was a great event of historic significance for the country's space program. 
Judging from these pictures released by the government, the communist regime's dictator Kim Jong-un was apparently all smiles as he watched his generals over the weekend launch a new high-thrust rocket engine at the Sohe launch station. Kim was surrounded by ecstatic soldiers after the test, some of whom appeared to be weeping, others jumping for joy, and one general even got a piggy bag from the dictator. Kim called the test the March 18 revolution, claiming that it marked a huge development for his country's satellite program, which he insists is for peaceful purposes. The U.S. dismisses that claim, saying it believes North Korea is working to develop nuclear warhead missiles that could reach the United States. The engine test comes after the regime conducted five nuclear tests and a series of missile launches in defiance of the United Nations. Experts say this latest test is an ominous sign of the North's intercontinental ballistic missile ambitions. We evaluate that North Korea has achieved a significant advancement in enhancing engine capability through this engine test. President Trump blasted the dictator, tweeting on Friday that North Korea is behaving very badly. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who is traveling in Asia, said America's attitude toward North Korea has changed. Let me be very clear. The policy of strategic patience has ended. Tillerson has said the North has nothing to fear from the U.S., but he also says diplomacy has failed. He's warned that the U.S. would consider a preemptive military strike against the regime and has called on China to do more to rein in its North Korean ally. George Thomas, CBN News. North Korea is spending at least one-third of its meager GDP on defense. It has no reason to defend itself against anybody. There's nobody threatening that regime except their own people. And to have uh, nuclear weapons and long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles for a little tiny country like that is insane. But <clears throat> they are intent on stirring up trouble and we're going to have to deal with it. It's going to be a tough thing. Do you use a military strike and knock out those uh, launch uh, vehicles? Do you wait till they're launched, then you shoot them down when they're in the air? <clears throat> do you bring on trade sanctions? What, what do you do? <clears throat> the big problem that South Korea faces is that the South Seoul is right at the DMZ. And the North has a number of conventional arms ready to incinerate South Korea, Seoul, and other cities down there. So <clears throat> the South Koreans are not very anxious to start a shooting war. But there is no way that those crazies that run that North Korean country are going to be placated. As one congressman said, it's a crime family in charge of a nation. And that's what we're dealing with, is a crime family in charge of the nation. And they have to be dealt with accordingly. Terry. Well, up next, the movement to bring our nation's elite universities back to their biblical roots. I think in many ways it's been a train wreck for 50 years in terms of the people going through these places, getting secularized and going out. See how this man is changing the status quo at Ivy League schools after this. Welcome back. You're watching The 700 Club. Christians helped start many of the nation's most elite universities, including Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Dartmouth. But in modern times, these universities have shed that heritage, becoming not only distinctly secular, but in many cases, anti-Christian. Caitlin Burke shows us how one ministry is fighting to bring these universities back to their founding roots. To Christian ministries, many college campuses might as well be putting out not welcome signs. Activists and campus administrators increasingly target Christian groups, one weapon, accusing them of failing to meet non-discrimination policies. I think a lot of times these campuses, I, I think about uh, the way um, the Soviet Union was years ago. They had a few show churches to make it look like a freedom religion, but behind the scenes, they do a lot to suppress it and keep it out as much as they can. Matt Bennett saw a need for more Christian influence at elite universities. I think in many ways, it's been a train wreck for 50 years in terms of the people going through these places, getting secularized and going out. I mean, the research we've done 
If you look at the most influential schools, maybe the top 20, and look at the top leaders in government, business, education, and media, about two-thirds of them went to those top 20 schools. In 2011, he started Christian Union to specifically focus on schools that consistently produce the nation's leaders. That's led to 10 campus chapters, including all the Ivy League. If we want to change the nation, we've got to hit these people and minister to them. These campuses have done us a great service. They brought together some of the most leadership-minded, uh, ambitious uh, young people in the country. And then our part is simply to tell them about Jesus Christ and, and disciple them in the Lord. Christian Union has faced some pushback from university officials, just as other Christian groups have on secular campuses. But Bennett has a more aggressive approach to dealing with discrimination, making it clear to the university that he won't back down or go away. When you do that, the universities end up respecting you more because of it. They know they can't just kind of roll right over you in whatever the circumstances. A pretty radical approach that's seen success on campus, but actually met resistance from Christians for its aggressive stand. Bennett's response is to point to the Apostle Paul. We need to be firm about it. Um, you see, wherever the Apostle Paul went in his travels, there was either riots or revival. When you preach the gospel and you put it forth, there's often reaction. So we should expect that, that that's normal and should happen. And not be afraid of it. There's going to be some turmoil from time to time. When Princeton University refused to recognize Christian Union, Bennett took a move from the playbook of powerful secular groups, hiring a civil rights organization. So they wrote a letter to the president of um, Princeton, and she wrote back in three days and said, you're absolutely right, um, you should be so. They did the right thing, and we're thankful for that. Um, they did in three days what they wouldn't do for us in three years. And his efforts have led to positive response from students looking for more than just academic achievement. I think these students are, are hungry for, uh, in their soul, the things of God, really just like everybody else. And it can be hard to be in touch with, with that when uh, you're running so hard after what's glamorized as success in the world's eyes. And, um, but all of, our, all of our hearts really are created, as Augustine said, um, for God, and they're going to be restless until they find rest in Him. Clay Cromer heads up Yale's chapter of the Christian Union. He says, believe it or not, students are finding the Lord in the Ivy League. Oftentimes they come here and realize, wow, I'm not the greatest in my town or city anymore at XYZ. I'm around a bunch of people just like me, you know, <laughs> and uh, so as people wrestle with those things, they can get in touch with uh, the needs they have, which are really for the Lord. Even having achieved, uh, you know, come to my dream school, that that did not satisfy and that, that was not it. I still, was still a, a longing within and, um, and a consciousness of need in me. and knew that somehow that had to do with God, but didn't really know like how I, what, I didn't know like what, what that looks like. In the midst of his search, Kenneth received an invitation to a Christian Union Bible study. It was there that I think I was seeing um, in someone um, light. Um, I just watching the way he was talking and the way he was reading the Bible and as if he actually loved it and, and believed it and there was reality there. Um, I knew he knew something I did not. He had something I, I did not have. Not long after that, on the floor of his dorm room, he begged the Lord to make him new. God met me there. I knew the, it seems like the, the guilt and, and the weight of that lifted off. And, and that was a joy and a peace that I'd never known before. And um, I knew I was, uh, I, I was in the presence of uh, more than who I am. In the competitive, rigorous, and stressful Ivy League environment, young men and women are experiencing the freedom only Christ can deliver. Now, with the support and encouragement from groups like Christian Union, they can grow their faith and spread God's influence around the world. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, New York. That is such an encouraging thing. And yes, is it happening? Yes, it's happening all over. We're delighted. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. But you know, the, the, we, we're fighting a strategic battle. And our enemies wanted to, for the high places, went for the centers of finance, went for the centers of education, went for the centers of political power. 
and went through courts. And one by one, they've been winning them. And now there's a backlash coming. And hopefully, it's coming in time to establish something better to keep this nation and this world from going into complete chaos. Terry. Well, coming up, we're going to take you out to the ballpark with the general manager of the San Francisco Giants for a unique view. What's cool about this sight line? Nobody else gets. You now, the best part of this seat is that the the uh, the cookies and coffee are in that room. <laughs> Bobby Evans shares the secret to building three world championship teams. That's next. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, today is the first day of spring, and that means the baseball season can't be far behind. Our sports reporter, Tom Buring, traveled to the ballpark to bring us this interview with the senior vice president and general manager of the San Francisco Giants. Take a look. This is AT&T Park, home of the San Francisco Giants, who build championship quality teams, not with baseball cards and fantasy leagues, uh-uh. Their general manager, Bobby Evans, is the real deal, and the guy that makes the real deals. Come on, just sign this guy, trade for him. What would we be surprised about in the process that complicates it or that accommodates it? Yeah, there's so many different uh, elements that factor into decisions. What our, our staff and player development people uh, understand about the person as well as the performance, but also their work ethic and the makeup of the player, dependence upon the analytics of the game now. There's economic factors. It is a complex formula, but again, it's, it's an organic process. It, it can't happen overnight. Some things just take time. Like his ascent within the organization. Hired in 1994 as an administrative assistant, Bobby's now emerged as both senior vice president and GM of the Giants, three-time World Series champions over the past seven seasons. On the field, does it get harder or easier sustaining that success? It is hard. It is getting harder. I don't think it's getting easier. There's obstacles from a financial perspective. There's obstacles in terms of the, the pool of talent, uh, the competition. You know, teams are getting better and stronger and they're sustaining success. Injuries, you know, players are getting older. You know, the turnover is, is a hard part of it. For you in the role that you are winning aside, that's always the given, but there's only room for one. What do you value the most in measuring success? It's a great question. There's a lot of ways to measure success, but for us on the field, it's having sustained success and having a chance to compete year in and year out. But I think that there's other ways, and just in terms of you know the culture of the organization and the hard work of our scouts, from whether it be free agent signings, trades, or our players coming up through the system, a lot of our success is measured in how what kind of impact we make in the community of, of San Francisco and the Bay Area. And you see success measured in the hearts of our players in terms of how they reach out. The year-round roster changes are time-consuming. Bobby's phone is never off, often requiring three full recharges per day. How did you guys do without a cell phone? Yeah, when I first started, I had to find the payphone in the restaurant first. <laughs> that was first, first and foremost. And if they didn't have a payphone, I couldn't have to find a new restaurant. As a Major League GM, Bobby is among a small fraternity of only 30 pro baseball executives. While his field of view is focused, his perspective stays simple. What's cool about this sight line? Nobody else gets. Now, the best, best part of this seat is that the, the, uh, the cookies and coffee are in that room. <laughs> How do you walk, Bobby, that tightrope of overseeing the organization, bringing guys in as a commodity to fill a need while caring for their well-being? Well, I think it just goes hand in hand. I mean, we care about the whole person, and so uh, this organization is its people and is it, it is its players. And I think as general managers, we don't want to lead our players astray to make decisions that affect their family and their future and their career based on misinformation. It all goes together. Unless you value uh, them first as a person, you'll never value them appropriately as a player. Bobby's league-wide reputation for integrity and consistency spans and links his public and private life. 
One of the ways I keep up with some of my closer friends is they come out to the ballpark. It blends sort of, you know, two worlds together and it's a great industry for families. You know, it's hard because you spend time apart as you work here, but how many places uh, can you work where your family is so welcome to come out and be a part of it? We should strive to be the same person, whether in a business meeting at the office or we're in a Bible study. Or how is excellence tied to biblical living? I mean, I think that's what Christ calls us to, uh, our best in Christ. Uh, and our best in Christ is really our best beyond ourselves, when our dependence is on Him and not on ourselves, and our, our trust is in Him, and we're not you know, performing for Him. We're trusting Him and allowing Him to do the work that He will do in His time in us and through us. And How does that practically assist you? There's a dependence on Him, and that's just part of life lived day to day. I look back on, on times in my life where I've experienced His presence, at a time where I felt like I needed direction, when, when I needed comfort and had lost my mom, and then not long later, my dad, and wisdom in the midst of His guidance. But it's ultimately, it's, it's a relationship that, that Christ gives us with Him, that we're privileged. The engineer and lead negotiator for one of baseball's storied franchises remains true to his childhood faith in his own pursuit of excellence. Part of relationships require time you know, with him and, and having the discipline to, to spend time hearing his voice or, or seeking him through his word as a man, a husband, and a father. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's no way to do it alone. That is a very intense environment, and yeah. surely your faith would play a huge it's, part it's in being amazing. able to handle it well. I don't see how you can do it. I mean, run out the batteries on three cell phones a day. I mean, that, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. That's absolutely unbelievable. That, Fascinating. Talk about Jerry Maguire. I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> Anyhow, I want to show you something else. Kim Hendry still remembers when she had to stand in line for food stamps. Her husband, Mac, recalls losing almost everything when the economy tanked. Today, the couple owns several thriving businesses, plus a number of exotic rental properties. And just one decision made all the difference. About an hour north of San Diego lies the tranquil town of Oceanside, California. Mac and Kim Hembry call this home. They enjoy the beautiful sunsets and peaceful atmosphere. And every day, they give God the credit. It's just stunning all the time. I wake up every morning thinking, I can't believe I'm here. Life is great. I'm very blessed to be healthy, and God's really blessed us, for sure. Mac and Kim now own several thriving businesses. But when they got married over 30 years ago, both were struggling financially. Kim was a single mom raising three children. When I was 32 years old, I went through a divorce and I was standing in the food stamp line waiting to get food stamps for my kids because I didn't have a job, didn't have any money, no sources of income. Mac was a real estate investor supporting four kids. He lost nearly everything when the economy tanked. Every option I explored and tried wasn't working. Didn't know how to make a living, honestly. Mac and Kim were both Christians. Even though they were struggling financially, they decided to make tithing a priority. When we first started out, we realized that we needed to put God first and then take care of our expenses and then try to live within our means, if not under our means. It's easy to give when you're, when you're financially blessed. But when you're really strapped, you know, you, you, you always kind of save that for last because you got to think of other things like housing and food and things like that. So you don't think about giving to God first and not worrying that, you know, He'll take care of you. Well, I was worried, but I believe you don't give up if you keep trying and that you can move forward. As the real estate market improved, they began making money flipping homes. Instead of pocketing all the profits, Mac wanted to invest in a collateral loan business. I saw things changing for the good. One thing after another, locations would open up that I didn't think was possible. Eventually, they could afford investing in rental property on Maui. Every piece of the property, God had his fingerprints on. It was miraculous the way he put it together. It was just amazing. As the couple's success grew, so did their giving. One day during one of the telethons, the Lord just laid it on my heart to just double my giving, and I did. And God just kept giving me more and more and more and more. 
Mac and Kim's net worth has tripled since their early days of flipping houses. They believe God has blessed them because they put Him first in every area of their lives. I just really feel strongly that if you're obedient, God will bless you. He'll take care of you. What a wonderful testimony. And ladies and gentlemen, it's true. You know, I was reading today where God was talking to Solomon and said, ask what I should give you. You know, ask what he, and, and Solomon said, look, I want wisdom. But these people, uh, Mac and Kim, have said to God, I want to serve you. We want to serve you and do what's right by you. And the results are in God's hands. And God says, okay, you're faithful to me. I'll be faithful to you. And look what I've done. Some of you want to join the seminar club. You say, I want to have that blessing. I want to enter into this new dimension of economics where God is pushing blessings at me. The blessings will actually run after you and try to overtake you. And those of you who do, I want to give you this. It's the secret kingdom, the laws of, um, of the, uh, of, and the law of expectation. These are the principles that I learned after many years of study and prayer, the Lord revealed to me how His kingdom worked, at least part of it. He didn't mean everything, but He gave me an understanding which was fabulous. And uh, I want to give this to you. When you join the 700 Club, 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and we can change the world. So would you please call in? It's easy to remember, 1-800-700-7000. Terry. Well, I want to tell you about Janet. She lives in Eugene, Oregon, and she said this after viewing The Secret Kingdom and the Law of Expectation. The Secret Kingdom and the Law of Expectation teachings are amazing. I paused the DVD many times so I could take notes. Eight pages. <laughs> I deeply appreciate getting both teachings, and I cannot thank you enough. And they really do make a difference. Understanding the principles Pat talks about Amen. will change your life. Mm -hmm. So call now. Well, Hercules is in the house. Coming up later, actor Kevin Sorbo talks about his latest role as the voice of God. So stay with us. Welcome to Washington for the CBN News Break. More than 30,000 runners from around the world took part in the seventh annual Jerusalem Marathon. The mayor of Jerusalem came up with the idea to draw people who wouldn't have otherwise visited the city. This year, Israel commemorated the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem. In addition to Friday's full marathon, there was also a half marathon, 10K, 5K, and a race for families. The course took runners past the ancient walls, through the old city, along historical routes in modern neighborhoods, and past Jerusalem's city center. Well, CBN India is bringing the medical gift of sight to those in need. CBN and its partnership with the Philadelphia Mission Hospital provided care to a remote village in India's largest state. A pre-screening camp saw more than 3,000 patients in need of critical or general eye care. The patients came from 13 surrounding districts to receive medical help, which included 837 cataract surgeries. Well, you can learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Actor Kevin Sorbo first made a name for himself playing the demigod Hercules. And now, in his latest project, Kevin plays the one true God. Take a look. Award-winning actor Kevin Sorbo is best known for his starring role in the popular TV series, Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, one of the most watched TV shows in history. Since then, Kevin has starred in numerous film and television projects, including Soul Surfer and the hit movie, God's Not Dead. As co-producer of his latest project, Breathe Bible Audio New Testament, Kevin is the voice of God and helps to bring the Bible to life with an all-star cast for an experience you will never forget. 
Well, please welcome back to the 700 Club, Kevin Sorbo. It's great to have you here. It's good to be back. I love coming here. Well, we talk a little bit about your Breathe mm -hmm. Bible project. How do you define this to people? You know, I call it, I call it theater for the mind yeah. is really what it is. <laughs> if you were in another room and hearing this, you would yes. think that someone's watching a movie. There's a whole different way to sort of look at and, and, and hear the word of God and word of Jesus because it's, it's, it's 90 actors portraying all the biblical characters in wow. this. And they have orchestra in the background. You have sound effects. When, when Jesus is actually being crucified, you will hear the cheering and the jeering and the praying and the crying. Yeah. You'll hear it. And it's, it's just a whole different way, not only strengthen the faith for those people of faith, mm -hmm. but really to bring people in that are, are curious and hopefully open-minded to listen to a different way of, of, of what the Bible sounds like. And that, people have like to say, oh, I don't read the Bible. It'd be boring for me. This isn't boring. Yeah. Well, and the word never comes back void once it goes out. Yeah. So you're projecting something into people's hearts and lives that is significant. Mm -hmm. Here you, you're playing the voice of God in this. I got an upgrade from my half guy days on Hercules, <laughs> yes. So I, I, I prayed. He said it was okay. God says, hey, I can sound like anybody. <laughs> so. what, does, what does one have to take in in preparation for uh, something like that? Because it's significant. It was. Carla Mari is, is, is the man who can really put this whole thing together. Tyndale is putting it out there. And uh, it's available now. They can go to breathebible.com. They can download. I got a throne. They can download the Book of Mark right now and hear awesome. it for free. Just get an idea of it. It's 18 CDs over 21 hours of, of like I said, theater. And uh, uh, but it was, uh, it, it was. I was amazed they called me up. I think it's because you know God's not dead. What if yes. Abel's Feel, other movies that I've done, has sort of opened this door for me to be hopefully a voice for mm -hmm. for for God and for Jesus. So this has been it's been a, quite an amazing ride for me to be part of this project. Who else is in here? You just mentioned. Uh, well, you got John Reese Davies. People know him certainly. He's a narrator. He, people know him from Lord of the Rings, from uh, Indiana Jones. Josh Lucas yeah. does the voice of Jesus. There's just a number of people in there. Like I said, if they go to BreatheBible.com, they can they can download it the way they want to download it, or they can order the box set itself and get all 18 CDs. It really depends on how people want to listen to, to uh, the New Testament. We've had audio cassettes and then sure. DVD, well, not DVDs, but audio cassettes and other audio Bible mm -hmm. readings. Is all of the element that you just mentioned what makes this one unique, that you feel like you're walking through it while you're listening yes, to it? Yes, no question. Because it, it is a different way. To me, it's like, it's an upgrade of, of the Bible, the upgrade mm -hmm. of the New Testament. And hopefully it does well, and we're gonna go into the Old Testament. Yes, And as wow. God's voice, I'll be very busy because he's, <laughs> he's very active in the Old yes. Testament. But um, it's gonna be, um, I, I, I think from the word I'm getting back from people already, they say that's just fantastic. How wonderful. Yeah. You've got a new movie coming up. I do. What's it won't come out until November. It's called, it's called um, uh, Let There Be Light. I think people have heard that phrase before. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's going to open uh, November. It's, I, I call it a Christmas movie. It covers about nine months in the year of life of this family. And uh, I'm, I directed it, and I'm in it. My wife, I'm the lead actor in it. My wife wrote it, and she, along with Dan Gordon, who's a wonderful wow. writer himself, has done quite a, bit, quite a few things. Uh, and she's in it. And um, they can go to Let There Be Light, the movie, uh -huh. dot com to okay. see uh, a trailer, uh, a couple different trailers on it. We got to spread the word on this. I get stopped all the time from people. It used to be because of Hercules or Andromeda. Yeah. People stop me all now because of God's Not Dead, yes. because of What If, and because of Soul Surfer. They say, please make more movies like this. Yes. Well, this movie is a wonderful, wonderful movie about bringing the light to the world. Because if you look at, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. we celebrate Christmas in the darkest week of the year. Yeah. And Jesus right. comes to us because yes. he's the light of the world. Yes. And that's why the, the title, I think, so and those wonderful. words are so significant. Yeah. I want to say that we have a little clip that we want to, to show of the movie. Yeah. And so what's happening in the scene that we're about to look at? I'm being visited by my, my ex-wife. Uh, I, I play a character uh, that is pretty much lost in his own world. And uh, he's a pretty negative person. He has not, no man of faith whatsoever. His ex-wife is. But he's, he's he turned to alcohol and drugs, and his life is definitely falling apart. Wow. Okay, let's take a look. Let there be light. I have to talk to you, okay? You have a shrink, and that's what you pay him for. Katie, give me up. Nobody but you would understand what I'm saying. Okay, no, no. I can't sleep. And I, I, can't, I can't think. I can't. I can't, I can't not think. I, I, I can't stop thinking about Davy, you know, and how he looked and how it felt and what he said. Wait, what? 
What did he say, Saul? He looked at me. And he said, Daddy, let there be light. And all, all I wanted to do was just, I wanted to put my arms around him. Powerful. Powerful. What do you want people to take away from this movie? I hope it almost opens up their mind to the possibilities yeah. of life after death. Yes. And Davy was our son who died at eight years of age. Mm. And um, I have a chance meeting with him through a series of events. And he tells me that uh, let there be light. Wow. And it changes a man's perspective on life and his outlook on life. And uh, it's, you know, it's a journey, hopefully, that people will take a look at and say, you know what, this is going to... Once again, I... I don't mind preaching to the choir. I think it's a wonderful thing to do out there. But you also want to reach out to those people that are wondering and have questions. Yeah, we, we all need to be yeah. preached to. <laughs> I, it's true. It's true. I've often wondered, how does one combine directing something and acting in it at the same time? Well, you know, I actually started directing back in my Hercules years. So it, it's always been there, and I love doing it. Acting is still my passion. That's uh -huh. what I want to be part of. But, uh, I, you know, it, I have a, had a great team around me. We used the same uh, group of people shot in Birmingham, Alabama that shot a movie called Woodlawn that uh -huh. came out last year. So uh, we had a great group of guys and a great support team. And my wife was there. She's, she, she's got her opinions, trust me. <laughs> so it was, but it was great. It was, it, was, it was just a really great journey. There's my family right there, That's actually. That's wonderful. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, this is, uh, it's been a great journey for me. So we'll watch for it. Let There Be Light is the movie. Yes. And then Kevin is the co-producer of the Breathe Bible Audio New Testament. He portrays the voice of God. Doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> it's an 18 CD set plus a free app that's available nationwide. So get a hold of well, get a hold of this and watch for the other. BreatheBible.com. Right? Check it exactly. out right now. Yeah. Thank you. Great to have you with us Good again. Good to be here. Thank you Appreciate for the quality it. projects. Thank you. Well, when we come back, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. Andrea wants to know: Can my child pray over his lunch at school? Stay tuned. You know Pat's got an answer for that. We'll be back right after this. Well, just a quick note about Regent University. In my opinion, it's one of the, if not the outstanding uh, Christian university in the world. And if you want to participate, you want to advance your education, there's still time. We've only got a short period of time before the next preview, but it's on March the 25th. A region preview, you can find out about graduate education, you can find out about online education. We've got a number of master's degrees, doctoral degrees, baccalaureate degrees, uh, in diverse fields from cybersecurity to nursing, all kinds of wonderful things that are available. And uh, uh, the number to call is 1-866-910-1111. That's the Regent EDU preview, or you can go online and find out about it, <clears throat> but you, there's still room and you're invited, and it'll be a marvelous, marvelous weekend. March 25, that's almost there, isn't it? It is, and the daffodils are rising They're as we speak. Rising. <laughs> still a little chilly, but it's going to get warmer. All right, we've got so time for here. some email questions we that you do. sent in. Okay, this first one comes from Andrea Pat, who says, Can my child pray over his lunch at school? While covering for a fifth grade Bible class today, I found out the kids that were, quote, caught praying over their lunch at school were sent to the back table. Of course, my initial thought was, they can't do that. Is it legal to tell children that they can't pray over their lunch food? And if they do, they will be punished by having to sit at the back table? Uh, this is one of the most outrageous things. Let me tell you something. We have rights if we're willing to fight for them. And if we're not, those who hate us will take away our rights. The idea that a child would in any way be punished because he or she prayed as he or she does at home over uh, their lunch is an outrage. It is a violation of religious freedom. It is a violation of the First Amendment. And I can go down the list. Now listen. Call the American Center for Law and Justice. Get one of the lawyers to write a demand letter to that school. If they will not comply immediately, bring an action for damages. I think it's time we start putting a hurting, hurting on some of those left-wing uh, teachers who are denying children their rights. That enrages me. It should enrage you. 
And I know we're not supposed to go away angry and fire coming out of our nostrils and everything, but we've got to stand up. And in a case like this, please call the American Center for Law and Justice, ask for a lawyer, and then go after that school system. And let them, I mean, I think it's time we start asking for damages. We start making those school systems know if they take away the rights of these precious little children, they're going to have to pay for it. Once that happens, they'll begin to back off and say, oh, 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 we can't do that. Okay. You know, the interesting thing about this is she was covering for a fifth grade Bible class. I mean, how, how did those two things exist in one I, I, school? I don't understand I don't what they're talking about. Strange. But anyhow, go Okay, ahead. this is Elizabeth who says, I'm a college student, completely lost, and I graduate in such a short time. My boyfriend and I just broke up, and life feels like a complete mess. I'm pursuing Christ daily, but depression and anxiety have completely taken over my life. How do I stay patient in the midst of God's work? Uh, the Apostle Paul said of a truth... I, in Christ I lie not, I die daily. I think it's time that what you do is die to self, spiritual. I'm not talking about physically. It's time that you die to all the stuff that's going on in your life and say, look, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. You've got so many things going on. You've got a love for your boyfriend who just walked away from you. You've got ambition, but you don't know what it is. You're completely unfocused. So you need to focus on the Lord and say, Lord, I am yours. Take me and then lead me in the course that you have for me. And then surrender. Let go. And you haven't done it. You're holding on. Let go. All right. This is an interesting question. This is from Michael who says, in 1 Chronicles 21, it says that Satan incited King David to take a census of the fighting men, and this angered God, so he struck them with a plague. Now, my question is this. What was so wrong about taking a census of the fighting men? You know, welcome to the club. I've, <laughs> I've struggled with that one for a long time. I really have. And I, I just said, God, what is the deal? Because if you go into the Old Testament in Numbers, they numbered the people, and God said, go ahead and number and, and, and count the numbers of fighting mm -hmm. men, count the numbers of, of Levi's, count how many children the Levi's, I mean, it was, count how many firstborn animals, I mean, it was a counting, a census. So for some reason, what the only thing I can think of it is, is that instead of being God's army, it became David's army. And it was a uh, thing of saying, I'm a big king in the middle of the Middle East, and I want to show off my power, and here's how I do it, by counting the troops. And this is the army I'm going to use to advance my career. That's the only thing I can figure. That was, that was wrong. The other isn't. It? Okay. Okay, this is Pete who says, God promised me that I would be together with someone if I pursued her. That person has returned to her own country and is in a serious relationship with another person. Did, guy lie, did God lie or willfully mislead me? I may, have met, I may have not heard God correctly, but I have been a Christian for a long time and I believe I did. I'm confused. I tell you, old buddy, God don't lie. Yeah. The Bible says God is not a man that he should repent. God is not a liar. God never lies. He is truth. He is yea and amen. You heard wrong. You imposed your will and made it the voice of God. You were praying and, and your will said, that beautiful girl is going to be my wife. And that's it. And yes, I heard God. You didn't hear any such thing. Get over it. She's gone on. She's getting married. Find yourself somebody else. And don't blame God for the fact that you didn't, you weren't mature enough to hear him. Surrender to him. What's that? This is Sonia who says, can I sow my tithe into a ministry online or on television and receive the same blessing? I'm not currently under a ministry, although I want to join somewhere. Also, the Lord has called me into ministry, but I want to make the right decision and work with the right people. How do I find the right relationships in ministry? I've been ordained, so I know it's all right to get started. You hear those words, I'm going to sow into this ministry, and I... I've got to be under certain authority. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a concept of the body of Christ that's a little bit in error. The body of Christ includes everybody who loves Jesus, who's committed to Jesus. 
and all the ministries they're doing, their schools and their missionary organizations and their humanitarian organizations and their churches, and they're all part of the body. And so rejoice in that part of the body and, and, and don't be saying, well, I've got to find exactly the relationship. The relationship is with Jesus, not with a piece of his body. And there's plenty of it out there. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm, uh, whatever it is, 16. 16. Mm -hmm. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, treasures for evermore. For Terry and all of us, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.